Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to service today. Uh, today is a special Sunday in our church year. You could kind of call it a pivotal Sunday uh, because we're pivoting. We're changing gears. We're changing directions. Today we remember the transfiguration of our Lord. Remember we went up on the mountain and a, a bit of his glory shone forth for the disciples to see. It's the end of the Epiphany season, which we've been in for, I think it's seven weeks now. Uh, what's interesting is the Epiphany season begins with Jesus' baptism and the voice from heaven saying, this is my son uh, whom I love. Today we're going to hear very similar words. Uh, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And so those, these two Sundays, these two readings sort of form the bookends for uh, the Epiphany season. And the shift we're making is uh, Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. And we move into Lent now and head toward Good Friday and Easter. And, and in the Gospels, we hear of how Jesus, uh, after the Transfiguration, kind of, uh, one Gospel says, set his face toward Jerusalem. So he, he began the last part of his journey to be our Savior. Let's stand and join together in our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We confess that we are unworthy servants. We have not always acted as children of God. We confess that we have left undone things we should have done, and we have done and said things that we should not have done and said. For those times when we have sinned against you, even unintentionally, we ask your forgiveness. We truly deserve only condemnation, but we pray that you, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your obedient and faithful Son, will forgive us and increase our faith, that we may rise to live before you in righteousness and true holiness. Jesus Christ abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For his sake and in his name, I proclaim to you the grace of God by which he forgives our sin 
and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I brought a picture and a little cool thing I wanted to show you for my object lesson today. I thought about it afterwards. I've got a picture I want to show you, and I probably should have put it on the screen, but you know what? I have the picture, and, and that my mind just kind of stopped at that point. So I'm going to come down a little closer so you can see it. Can you make it out in the back? When you can. It's, it's a picture of my great uncle, my dad's uncle, uh, standing in front of a big lake. Like this lake looked like it's probably 15 feet long. Like it's huge. Uh, he used to live in Los Angeles and he worked in uh, the oil field in producing machinery for them and fixing machinery. Uh, and I always thought he was just a machinist, but last time I was visiting with that, I found out he was actually an engineer, a mechanical engineer. And I never asked, I don't know if I've asked him, but Ken, what kind of engineer are you? Electrical. Electrical. I thought so, but I wasn't 100% sure. Uh, so I was thinking Ken and I could have been like best buds. If, if I could have got the ring, the engineer's ring from my great uncle, I could have worn it and then people would have thought I was smart. But uh, he also, I think it's kind of cool. He, he designed and built a dishwasher. And, oh, I should have brought, I still have some little badges that go on it. Maybe next week I'll try to remember. Uh, the funny thing is, it's called a dish space washer. Because what it, it was a thing that washed the dishes. It wasn't one word when he invented it. And it was this contraption that sat over your sink and just had a, a hole in the bottom. And then you took it up to your tap, and the tap would run the, the washing part, and all the stuff would just go down your sink. And uh, actually saw one on the internet, which was kind of cool. It was very 1950, sort of looked like a UFO, crossed with a VW club. <laughs> so now the thing I really wanted to show you was one of his drafting sets that I have. And uh, you know, it's got little dividers and it's got ones with pencils so you can make marks. Uh, it's got ones that are specially made to use ink because they still used ink back in the day. And I think this is, I don't know if you can see it. I'll bring it to the back after church. I think this is really cool. I'm glad I have it. Uh, I use it sometimes, although probably nowhere near to its full potential. But I, I, if you know me, you know I like old kind of stuff, right? And uh, part of me also, I like to use old stuff. I don't just like to see it in a museum behind glass. You know, if it's something that's old and still actually in use, to me, that's cooler. Because it was kind of, it was designed to be used. And so it's nice to be able to use them. Bibles are a lot like this. Uh, they're old. Maybe they're cool. Uh, I've been to people's houses. I'm sure it was nobody here. But their Bible was sitting on the, the coffee table. And it didn't have a little glass box over it. But it could have. You know, and it has all the family baptisms and marriages and deaths written in it. And it's sort of like a sacred text. And by that I mean you don't touch it. Right? You don't open it. You don't look at it. You don't read it. You don't use it. And while that's kind of old and cool... That's not why God gave us his word. That's not what Bibles are about. God gives us his word to be used, uh, to be read, to be struggled with, to be studied, to be nurtured and strengthened in our faith as we read it. And so even though it is something that's very old and very cool, and maybe you don't use your family Bible, but if you have a, you probably have a different Bible at home that you can use uh, each day to spend a little time using the, the gift, the tools that God has given you to strengthen and feed your faith. We'll continue now with our readings. The first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 to 12. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of the Pisgah across from Jericho. There the Lord showed him the whole land, from the Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, the territory Ephraim and Man Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev and the whole region from the Valley of Jericho 
the city of palms as far as Zor. Then the Lord said to him, this is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab. As the Lord had said, he buried him in Moab in the valley opposite Beth Peor. But to this day, no one knows where his grave is. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak nor his strength gone. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listed, listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. The epistle reading is from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant to all, in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his glory, sorry, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel reading is from Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 36, and it is the account of the transfiguration. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up on a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving, as the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. This is the word of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends in Christ, as I mentioned, I'm going to focus our attention for a few moments on our gospel reading and the transfiguration of our Lord. As I look at all of you sitting there today, I know that there's a few of you who have experienced being a pioneer. Now, by that, I don't necessarily mean someone who moved to a, you know, a strange land and lived in a, a sod hut at minus 40 or something like that. But we've all done things that are new to us, things we've never tried before, whether it's a change in job, a change in career, a change in where we're living, and actually, I'm just looking. I, well, Guy, you kind of, you came out here when this was all pretty wild country still, didn't you? I mean, not back in the old days, but yeah. when Campbell River had how many people? Do you remember when you were a kid? Uh, Campbell River was like about 12,000. 12,000, okay, yeah. So we've, we've more than tripled since Guy was here. If we still had, you know, Mabel and Anna, I mean, they were, they were pioneers, right? They, 
They knew what it was like to live a long ways away from civilization out here in Campbell River. Uh, and actually, for this church, I don't know if you saw the pictures. At, at one of our anniversaries, and we'll probably bring it out the next anniversary, we've got a picture of those two young ladies up in the rafters. Like when stuff, there's no roof on yet, and they're, they're nailing stuff together. Uh, they, were, they were pioneers. And back when this church was built, I don't know how many people there were connected to it, but there weren't an awful lot, right? I mean, it was a, it was a commitment. It was a struggle. It was hardship. But it was wonderful, right? Everybody working together and pulling together and doing something that really in some ways is far beyond what they really should have been able to accomplish when you consider the resources they had, but they made it work. As God's people, we're called to be pioneers. And we stand in a long history of pioneers. Uh, you think of Abraham, or Abram as he was known at the time. Right? He was a, a well-to-do farmer who God said, come on, pack up everything, let's go. And he said, where? And God said, I'll show you when you get there. And away he went, stepping out, literally, right, step after step in faith. And it was a long journey, a journey of faith for Abraham. And then we've got Moses. We heard about him in our reading today, right? One of the people that appeared with Jesus. Uh, Moses had a nice, comfortable life as a shepherd. And God called him then to go to Pharaoh and do something totally outside of his comfort zone. In fact, if you look at all of the prophets in the Old Testament, they were called from comfortable lives, often to difficult and uncomfortable, unknown situations, but they followed. The disciples, Jesus said, follow me. And then he began wandering around for three years, and they didn't know what was on the agenda. They didn't know where he was going. They didn't understand what it was about, but they, one foot after the other, followed him, listened to him. There are many times in our lives when there's things that we're called to that we feel are impossible. New situations, difficult situations, hardships that we'd rather not face, but thankfully we don't face them alone. We have a Lord who is with us and who walks with us. In the, the good times, you know, the mountaintop experiences, we still call them that today. Even when we go down into the valley of the shadow of death, he's with us. The interesting thing about pioneers, and this is true like just across the board. I think it's a human thing. Pioneers tend to drift into becoming settlers, right? Like they go out into the wilderness and they start chopping down trees and building their house. And before you know it, they've got a mall and a video store and a grocery store, right? I mean, and they're, they're comfortable in their life and they don't want to go and live out in the bush again with no heating, no air conditioning, no running water. I mean, they, they settle down. And, and I wonder if that wasn't part of what Peter was saying, right? We're told in scripture, he said, let's just stay up here, right? This is, this is amazing. Let's just settle down and enjoy it. But Jesus had other things in mind, right? He had other things he had to do. And so he led the disciples down the mountain and toward the cross. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know what they were doing, but they followed Jesus lead in the we had a reading from the book of hebrews today that book was written for jewish christians who were facing one of those pioneer times you know a pivotal point in their lives when they had heard the message of jesus believed he was the messiah but what that meant was they were going to have to step out in faith and by that i mean they were going to have to step outside the synagogue right and begin to gather with fellow christians and that doesn't seem like a big deal. But in the Roman Empire, which the Holy Land was a part of, only the Jews were exempt from worshiping Caesar. Okay, they were the only ones that got a pass. This new upstart group, Christians, they didn't get that courtesy. They had to make a sacrifice to worship Caesar. And if not, 
That was treason, and they could face death. So stepping out in faith was a, a dangerous and a scary thing. And it's a still a dangerous and scary thing to us today. Now, I want to tell you a story. And I tried to find out, I don't know if it's true or not, but I can certainly understand that it would be true. It's about a little community on the east coast of the United States, north, northeastern coast. Uh, you know, people have been there for a fairly long time, you know, not compared to Europe, but they were there in the early days. And a group in this small community right on the shore came together to form a life-saving society. Because where they were, you know, coming into the port, there was treacherous rocks. And ships were often breaking up on those rocks. And, and sailors were, ended up in the water in some terrific storms. And so they came together. They built a little shack where they kept their, you know, their life preservers and, and their oars. And they kept their boats down on the beach. And they took turns watching and, and keeping an eye on things, especially during storms. And if there was a storm, they'd all come together. They would row out rescue as many people as they could, bring them back, warm them up around the stove in their little shack. You know, and the sailors were mighty thankful for the service they provided. They quickly outgrew the little shack, right? They needed more room to store their stuff and, and they needed more room so that they could have a spot where people could dry off and, and somewhere that the people who weren't wet, you know, the, 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 the people who came as support people where they could stay and be dry and comfortable. And then a little while later, uh, it, it became a place where they'd go for beach bonfires. And we can understand that, right? I mean, we love our beach bonfires. But then they thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could eat indoors? And so they built a little bit of an extension onto their little shack and, you know, set up some tables and put in a little bit of a kitchen. And then other people started to hear about this, like, hey, this is great. We can have our family together. We can go there and have a meal. And, and pretty soon, it wasn't a life-saving society anymore. It was a yacht club. It had beautiful grounds, fantastic facilities. People came from near and far. You paid a lot of money to support this beautiful facility and to use it. Uh, the boats weren't wooden boats kept upside down on the beach anymore, ready to save people. They had proper piers and docks and locks to keep the unwanted people from going and messing around with their boats. They moved from being pioneers, from serving and caring to looking out for themselves and enjoying what they had built. We're going to be pioneers shortly. We're going to be getting a new pastor, and we don't know who. And that's going to be new, it's going to be exciting, it's going to be different, and I hope it's going to be enough different that it shakes things up. Because in some ways, we're a little bit, not completely, you guys get credit for that, but a little bit like that life-saving society, right? We're here, we've got a, a great facility, we've got lots of people, we can pay the bills, we're happy, we're comfortable, the heat is on. And we begin to, or churches can, like I said, we, I'm proud of you guys, Right? You still have that looking out beyond the walls, but it, were, it can become seductive, I guess, to just try and, and fight and keep things the way they are, keep things nice and comfortable and secure. We know what's happening next week. We know what's going to happen next month. It'll probably be very similar next year, but you know, all that's going to change because we're going to be Blessed by God with a new pastor who's going to do things differently. Who's going to have different ideas, a different personality. And like I said, when I, when I announced my retirement, I'm excited about that. I can't wait to see where God is going to lead us to step out in different directions of faith from the ones that we're used to. And, you know, we're also stepping out in faith in a different way as well. Because, hopefully soon, we're going to be doing ministry in a post-pandemic world. And we're not even sure what that means, right? Or what that looks like. That we're, we're called by God to reach outside and to care for people 
But it's a different world. People, people are different. They're going to be looking at life different, at their lives different, at eternity different. And God is calling us to step out and to reach out as a life-saving society to them. So we need to remember to reach and aspire for things that we could not do unless God blesses them. To step out in faith, to take some chances. And by the way, we need, we're going to need to start doing that here in the next few weeks, right? We're not, I'm not just going to sit back and wait for the next pastor, and I hope you're not either. Because there are some things that we can start to pick up and start doing again, start to do differently, so that we can be equipped and prepared to be pioneers in our world not settlers. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand as we continue confessing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God. <clears throat> from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for hearing our prayers on behalf of Annalise and Wendy Lee, and that things are moving forward for Annalise, and that Wendy Lee is uh, free from the pain and discomfort she was having. We pray that you'd continue to be with Annalise in the waiting and with all of the family, that you would give us peace and comfort, that the surgery would come soon, be successful, and that no follow-up treatments would be needed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for all of those who are suffering with COVID, but we especially pray today for Kathy and Nicole, we ask, Lord, that you would bring them through this safely, that they would not become too ill with COVID, and that their recovery would be full. We also pray for Quinlan and Johnny as they deal with ongoing COVID issues. And Lord, we pray that you would bring healing to them, freedom from pain and a restoration of proper taste for Johnny. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for Bill as he's facing health challenges. Lord, we pray that you would be with him and grant him healing. Guide the doctors in the testing they're doing. And Lord, we pray that in the care that he receives from them, your healing hand would be active and powerful. Be with his family, Lord, as they wait and as they worry about him. Give them your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for the many civilians who did not start this war, but who are suffering in it. Lord, we pray for the, the soldiers and the leaders of Ukraine, that you would be with them, give them strength and courage and wisdom. Lord, we pray for our, our missionary in Ukraine, uh, Oleski, that you would be with him and his family and keep them safe. That you would be with the head of their church, uh, Alexander Yuchenko. That you would witness through him and through Oleski to a world that is full of hurt and death and, and threat of death. We pray, Lord, that you would be with all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Keep them safe at this time. And Lord, we pray that you would work through the leaders of this world and through the power of your spirit to restore this region to peace and security. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask that you'd be with Dawn's housekeeper as she is facing a difficult situation 
and moving away from a, a situation of domestic abuse. We thank you for the strength and the courage you've given her. We pray, Lord, that others would come alongside her to be resources to her to share this burden. And Lord, we ask that you would bring her and her family to safety. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be with Christina as she travels home from Houston. We ask that the trip would be safe and that her time at home would be a blessing to her. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for Doris in the home down in Comox. We thank you for the care that she's receiving, and we pray, Lord, that you would continue to be with her, to give her your peace, your patience, that she would be a blessing to those around her, to share her faith and to lift up and encourage them. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may, with one voice, glorify the Lord, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Our closing hymn is a prayer of pioneers.